My name is Javier Ortego. I'm a tenured scientist at the CSIC, and I work at the National Center for Animal Health. In my laboratory, we've spent many years working to develop vaccines against diseases of importance in animal health, and especially on the development of vaccines against blue tongue virus. Blue tongue disease is caused by a virus. The blue tongue virus is an infectious disease, but it's not contagious. It's not contagious in the sense that this virus is transmitted by insects, by arthropods of the genus Culicoides. It's a disease that, due to its form of transmission, spreads very quickly. Hence, because of the significant economic problems caused by this disease, it's catalogued by the World Organization for Animal Health and by European community on the list of notifiable diseases. This disease is caused by the blue tongue virus, an orbivirus in the Sidoreoviridae family, which also includes other viruses of importance to animal health, such as African horse sickness virus. This virus comprises three protein envelopes, with the outermost envelope incorporating the VP2 protein, the most variable component of the virus, to which the antibodies against the disease are raised. Thus, because it's the most variable part, 29 serotypes of this virus have already been described. This factor is important when developing vaccines because it equates to the presence of 29 different diseases, hence the importance of this virus. In addition, this virus is endemic to every tropical and subtropical, or currently temperate, areas of the planet. It's found on every continent except Antarctica. And because of global warming and the uncontrolled and irregular movements of cattle, the spread of this disease is increasing, even to places as far north as the UK where serotype 8 virus was confirmed in 2006, as well as Sweden and Germany. In other words, a disease that was more typical in Europe, in Mediterranean areas, has migrated north because of factors such as increased temperatures. The virus and the disease are found in areas where its transmitting vector is distributed. These are mosquitoes of the genus Culicoides, which are also called jejenes, midges, here. So, because of global warming, it's possible for populations of these arthropods to become distributed in more temperate zones. The Culicoides species most associated with the disease are, in the case of Europe, Africa and Asia, Culicoides imicola, although in Europe, in the serotype 8 outbreak in 2006, C. obsolidus was also highly implicated. In turn, in North America, C. sonorensis is responsible for this disease. Blue tongue virus primarily infects both wild and domestic ruminants. In domestic animals, where more clinical symptoms occur, it's usually in ovine species, in sheep. Although serotypes of this virus have also been detected in cattle and goats that have strongly affected these species, resulting in clinical symptoms. For example, serotype 8 virus in cows and a serotype 1 in the case of goats. In addition, this disease can infect wild ruminant species, which is a problem because they do not have clinical symptoms. They're asymptomatic, meaning they'll become disease reservoirs that cannot be detected. That's one of the biggest problems in the case of wildlife. There have even been very rare cases of infections, either symptomatic or with clinical signs, in zoos, in animals kept in zoos in cities, where there's an outbreak of the disease, such as in bison or any type of ruminant kept in a zoo. It's also important to note that in recent years, so-called atypical serotypes have been described. These have been described primarily in goats, because in these cases the viruses aren't transmitted by culicoides and they don't produce clinical symptoms. That's why it's taken a long time to describe these serotypes, because in reality it wasn't until we started to do massive DNA sequencing that we found orbiviruses, blue tongue viruses, that weren't standard. These viruses are transmitted by contact and are therefore contagious. While they don't produce clinical symptoms and in principle aren't a problem, if these animals, these goats, because in small wild ruminants it usually occurs in goats, become infected with a virulent serotype, 
The genome segments of the virus could rearrange and produce another serotype with unknown virulence. It could become a danger, or it could be nothing. But we must be very careful, because this can occur. We have to be very alert to new variants and what these variants are like. Because if a virulent virus transmitted by contagion is generated, this type of disease and how it's controlled would be different. Regarding the transmission of this virus, as we've already said, this virus is transmitted by insects of the genus Culicoides. In reality, it's only the females, because they're hematophagous insects that, when producing eggs, need blood for the production of those eggs. The female bites the animal, she makes an incision in the skin, and while she takes blood, the virus passes directly into the digestive tract of the insect. There it'll actively replicate, and through the hemocele, it will reach and accumulate in the salivary glands, until the virus reaches sufficient levels for transmission to become possible the next time they feed. The time during which the insect can be infectious is usually 2 to 10 days later. It all depends on the temperature of the site where the outbreak occurs, because insects, as we all know, are cold-blooded animals and are unable to regulate their temperatures, while the virus needs a specific temperature to be able to replicate. So a temperature of 25 degrees for between 2 and 10 days are needed. Two days if the temperature rises to 30 degrees Celsius, but if it goes down to 15 degrees Celsius, it can take weeks for enough virus to be produced so that this insect can transmit again. Below 12 degrees Celsius, it's been described that this virus doesn't replicate inside the insect. Once transmission has occurred, these two very small insects can fly about two or three kilometers. However, in extreme storm or wind conditions, they can move up to 300 kilometers. This means that the disease can be spread to a very wide range of terrain. As I've already said, once this infection has occurred, then it infects a ruminant animal. In cattle, viremia can last up to 100 days. It's a very long period. In sheep, it's a slightly shorter viremia, but it's still long, usually 30 or 40 days. Why? Not because the virus is infectious inside the animal. Rather, this virus takes advantage of, once replication has occurred and the animal is infected, i.e. the lungs and lymph nodes, which causes the disease of this virus, it hides in the membranes of red blood cells. This allows it to escape from the immune system and stay hidden, using these cells as a Trojan horse. The virus doesn't infect the red blood cells, it stays hidden during this period, which can take up to 100 days. In the case of sheep, once there are clinical signs, mortality can reach up to 70%. The mortality is high when clinical signs appear. If an outbreak enters a herd, it's normal for 100% of the sheep to be infected, some with more symptoms, others with fewer symptoms. This supposes a serious economic problem. Regarding the clinical signs, this disease is also called ovine catarrhal fever because it produces a kind of catarrh. Mucus will be produced. There'll be inflammation of the mouth and nose, a runny nose, fever, apathy in the animal, and it can cause leanness. It can also infect the coronary artery and the aortic arch. It can infect certain tissues because it's able to infect endothelium. This causes breakages to occur and also produces internal bleeding. That's where the name blue tongue disease comes from. It's actually very rare to find a blue tongue in an infected animal. Although the name is blue tongue, it doesn't usually occur, and when it does, it's caused by cyanosis in the tongue. These are bruises produced by the breakage of capillaries. All of this, these clinical symptoms, cause the animal to deteriorate, both in terms of milk production as well as the wool quality, which will be very poor. It can also cause infertility, here we've talked about the normal transmission route, the one that usually occurs. However, there are other routes of transmission, depending on the serotype. For example, serotype 8 causes abortions, as well as transplacental transmission. So, depending on the serotype, the clinical symptoms cause the animals to deteriorate, which is a problem when it comes to selling them. 
All this is a problem that, especially in domestic cattle, causes large economic losses. Obviously, the most direct problems are those occurring in the quality of cattle. But not only that, as we said at the beginning, it's also a notifiable disease. In the event of an outbreak of this disease in a restricted area, you can't sell your livestock outside that restriction zone. So the problem isn't only that the animals deteriorate, but also that you can't take them out of the restriction zone, which impedes trade and entails very notable economic losses. As for control, how we can try to keep this disease under control, on the one hand, given that this disease is transmitted by vectors, vector control is usually used. So in Culicoides populations, we try to determine whether the virus is present or not. This is also done in ruminants. Sentinel animals at certain sites are usually analyzed to check for the presence of the virus or not. How is this done? How is it controlled? The same techniques that everyone knows for other viruses are used. These are, to check the presence of the virus, RT-PCR, which tells you if there's viral RNA in the animals. ELISA assays are also usually performed to serologically control the disease and check if IgG or IgM antibodies are present, if the animal has had the disease and to check their status. Thus, we carry out an epidemiological control and also determine the serotype. Although ELISA isn't very serotype-specific, RT-PCR does allow us to test for the 29 serotypes. So we can say, here, there's an outbreak of the disease, and it's serotype 1, 2, 5, or 8. The most obvious way to control possible outbreaks of the disease is the use of vaccinations. It's my field. I work in vaccines. So I firmly believe that the best way to keep this disease under control is, as in many other infections, with vaccination. There are two types of blue tongue virus vaccines. Some are produced in South Africa and are attenuated live vaccines. But in Europe, these are banned because they have the problem that they can cause the disease since the animal is being inoculated with the live virus. In Europe, inactivated vaccines are used. Inactivated vaccines have been used for this virus since the 1970s. They are safe vaccines. In these vaccines, the virus is dead, it's inactivated, and so it'll never cause the disease in any case. But rather, it will produce an immune response, and especially produce antibodies against the virus that will protect the animals very well from the clinical symptoms. Furthermore, because it's an inactivated dead virus, there can be no reorganization of gene segments. So they have many more advantages than live attenuated vaccines. However, inactivated vaccines also have problems. They're serotype specific. Nevertheless, they're capable of ending outbreaks of serotypes 1, 2, 3, or 8, the latest outbreaks that have appeared in Europe in recent years. So they're effective because, on the one hand, they prevent the clinical symptoms. This is very important so that the state of the animals doesn't deteriorate. On the other hand, if an animal has some viremia after an infection, it's so low that transmission to insects is prevented, thereby cutting off the transmission path. There are also drawbacks, of course. These vaccines are serotype-specific, so you have to wait for an outbreak to occur, see what serotype it is, and then vaccinate the animals. But there have already been attempts to use bivalent vaccines with multiple serotypes, such as serotypes 1 to 4, which have worked perfectly well.